Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe. I'm very excited to welcome Mark Lynn to this special bonus episode of the podcast celebrating The Birdcage, which turns 25 on March 8th. How are we doing, Mark? I'm doing great. Glad to be back. So tell me about The Birdcage, Mark. When did you first see this movie and kind of what are your, what are your thoughts about it? Oh, gosh. Uh, I would have... So this I'm... came out in the spring of 96. Yeah. Definitely wouldn't have seen it in theater because <laughs> I would have, I would, well, I would have been nine. I would have turned 10 in the summer of 96. Okay. So probably not the kind of movie my parents would have said, yeah, <laughs> let's go see it. But okay. uh, I do remember seeing it uh, maybe when I was around 12 or 13, if I had to guess the first time I saw it. And I remember, th I, I think... I liked, well, number one, I, I liked the fact that it, you know, Robin Williams, I mean, he was such a- He was essential. huge. He was yeah. huge in the mid nineties. Yeah. Of course. So yeah, if you were, yeah, our age, I mean, he was a, a, a mega star, you know? Mm. So, he, and he was appealing to all ages. He was appealing to adults. He was appealing to kids. So yeah. I think the fact that you would go, oh, it's a Robin Williams movie. Like, you know, of mm. course, I'm totally going to see it, but it's, it's different than some, it, it's a bit more of, it's a bit more of an adult subject, I think. Than oh, yeah. With it more like Mrs. Doubtfire or Aladdin, mm -hmm. things like that. But I, so I, I, I remember thinking that I liked the, I liked the comedic aspects of it, especially like Nathan Lane's character and his, the, the mannerisms and the, the crazy things that yeah. he did in the movie. But it wasn't until I was older that I really came to appreciate the, the other elements of the movie and it's the the theme and a lot of the mm. conversations that were going on around it so it took me a while to really sink into the what the movie was really about at its core so this is one of my all-time favorite movies mark mm -hmm. like i would put it if not in my top 20 definitely in my top 30 definitely one of my five to ten favorite comedies ever it it's has a special special role in my heart from when I saw it as a kid. So get this, Mark. I saw this not just once, but twice in the theater. Oh, wow. I was 11. So <laughs> yeah, I was born in 84. So I was 11 in the spring of 96. And it's funny you mentioning, I was trying to think this morning, I was like, how did I get my parents and my grandparents <laughs> to take me to this movie? And I wow. think Robin Williams, I think he was the way into this. So yeah. in the spring of 96, I don't think I was aware going into this for the first time that it was about gay characters. I think I just knew that it was Robin Williams. It was a comedy. Yeah. And the one memory I have, so I was in uh, Sacramento, Roseville area of Northern California at the time in the spring of 96. And in the Sacramento Bee, the critic Joe Baltic gave the birdcage four stars out of four and called it uh, tears rolling down your face funny and I wow. remember showing that to my parents and you know Mrs. Doubtfire also one of my favorite movies and definitely a you know huge huge movie for me back in the mid 90s I was like Robin Williams in a new comedy and it got four stars can we see it like I don't think my parents knew what the movie was about when they took me I don't remember yeah. if they knew that it was rated R watching it again last night like there's some substantial f-bombs in this movie not to mention the, like the content like this probably is not the most appropriate movie for an 11 year old now let alone in 96 yeah but i loved this movie so much that i convinced my grandparents to take me for a mm -hmm. second time and i still remember my grandpa walking out of the theater shaking his head saying something like what was that all about <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah so, so I mean I didn't know everything about myself in the spring of 96 I wasn't like watching the birdcage and being like this movie is molding me into <laughs> first, like no I just really love the story and even at that young age I could understand like the conflict and like what why the movie was working so well like this gay couple has to appeal to this conservative couple and I mean it's still I think it still holds up really well today. I mean, there's a couple of things about it we'll talk about. Yeah. Uh, but l literally like with my notebook last night watching this, I'm like, okay, I'm going to find two or three things I don't like about the movie today. And I could not find one. 
I was like, there's got to be something, a scene that's too long, a lull, this or that. Mm -hmm. I really have 25 years on, I've seen this movie 10 or more times. I really don't have anything negative to say about the movie. Is there anything about the movie that does not work for you, Mark? That's just, you're like, nope. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to side with you on that. It's really, I, I you know? agree with you. I think it's aged well. I think it handles, and that's, some, I guess that's something we'll cover in a little bit, but yeah. I, I think it, it does handle the, it does handle the portrayal of gay characters with, I, I think it handles it with respect yeah. and with trying to, I mean, you know, there, there are a couple of characters that, I mean, the Nathan Lane character obviously is <laughs> yeah. very over the top and very flamboyant, but I don't think they're doing it in a cartoonish way. Yeah, they're, they're not cartoons. This movie treats true. all these characters yeah. as real people. It's, a, it's the first movie I remember seeing about gay people that didn't treat them as jokes, didn't treat them as homicidal villains. Like they're real three-dimensional characters in this movie, even when, as you say, they're kind of over the top. And they're the leads. And it's yeah. also, it's not a tragedy. It's not good. No. Yeah, they're usually portrayed as like, you know, mm -hmm. comical. Well, I mean, yeah. well, see, they're comical. But yeah, you know, like yeah. jokes, like not to be taken seriously, or they're portrayed as going through some great tragedy. And in this yeah. film, it, no. It you know, not, there's, yeah. there's a moment of suspense right at the end where, you know, the conservative parents are confused. Like, wait, who is the real mom? And that could have been, that, that's done really well. Like it's, there's a fine line there. You know, the movie never makes Gene Hackman and Diane Weiss out to be the villains. Like, you know, right. at first you're like, oh, okay, the, I'm not going to really like these two maybe. But as the movie goes on, you really kind of care about them too. And by the end when they're dancing and they're singing in the house and, you yeah. know, it, like you really at the end of this movie love everybody here. There's not a villain and a protagonist in this movie. Like they're all great, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I, I, I've been watching this movie many, many times. Did you watch it again for this episode? Like, did you watch it afresh? Uh, not recently, but okay. it's a movie that I've seen enough times where I, I, I now I kind of want to watch it again now that we're talking more about it. <laughs> so, yeah, la I, so I watched it again last night. I, I had, I'd seen it like parts of it on TV. I hadn't watched it in full for at least probably 10 years. It's been a while. And uh I was like, okay, what's going to be the biggest laugh this time? Because it's one of those like Dumb and Dumber. I know it so well yeah. that it's hard for me to laugh very much because I know everything that's coming. So really the laughs come from like the behavior of, of Nathan Lane, which is just always amusing. Yeah. But my biggest laugh last night had to be Hank Azaria's bow, uh, <laughs> which yeah. I forgot about. I remembered the him tripping. I remember he can't wear shoes. And, you know, some of the stuff he says to the characters, I forgot when he bows and I lost it, Mark. Yeah. For a movie that I love this much that I've seen so many times, for me to still to this day lose it laughing yeah. <laughs> at uh, so many things. So let's kind of take it, for this one, let's kind of take it from the beginning to the end, right? So, because this movie's really in three parts. One thing mm -hmm. I forgot, Mark, is that this movie really just takes place over about 24 hours. I forgot that. I thought it was like over a week or something. Like yeah. he comes home at night, tells his dad, I'm getting married. And, uh, you know, he wants to bring the parents to come meet with them. And that's like the next day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I forgot, I was like, oh, this, the, like the time frame of this movie is like 24 hours long. I thought it was longer than that. <laughs> like I was yeah. noticing things this time around. Um, so before we get into like the storyline of everything in the movie and what we like about it, you know, in terms of uh, like who put this together. So this was directed by the great Mike Nichols. Uh, the director of The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Yeah. His career was not exactly on fire in 1996, Mark. So he, his last big success would have been Working Girl in 1988. Wow. Okay. Starring uh, Melanie Griffith and Harrison Ford and Sigourney Weaver. That was his last right. big kind of hit movie, critical acclaim. Uh, after that, I'm trying to remember if he had one in 89 or 90. I know he directed a film called regarding Henry in 91 with Harrison Ford and that movie didn't do very well and then he did Wolf with Jack Nicholson turning into a werewolf oh with, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer <laughs> I about that movie wow. from 94 so it come early 96 Mike Nichols career at least as a film director was not at the top right this yeah. movie brought him back big time this was a huge hit 
It was yeah. number one. I forgot. I read this last night. It was number one at the box office in the U.S. for three weekends in a row. Wow. Uh, an R-rated comedy with gay characters as yeah. the leads to get well, number one three three weeks in a row. I think we can fairly say a huge part of that was Robin Williams. Yeah. I mean, he was at oh, the... Yeah. He was a huge box office draw at that point. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. So this did really well. It made like 120 plus million in the U.S. alone. So this brought Nichols back big time. He would have a, not as big of a hit, but a pretty good, at least critical hit two years later with uh, Primary Colors in 1998 oh, with nice. John Travolta and Emma Thompson. Yes. But I would say this, The Birdcage was Mike Nichols' last like real big hit blockbuster movie. Like this was like the last really big money earner for him. And it, what's interesting about this movie was that it was written by the great Elaine May, who collaborated with Mike Nichols like in the 50s into the maybe like the early 60s. Mm -hmm. They were like a duo on stage together, like doing comedy, oh, wow. like decades and decades earlier. And then they had kind of like lost touch. They weren't really working together for many, many decades. And then they came back in the 90s. She wrote this script and she wrote Primary Colors, which earned her an Oscar nomination. So decades after collaborating, like on the stage together, they make these two kind of hit movies in the nineties, kind of like an interesting, uh, yeah. you know, like okay. kind of at the end of, I mean, they're, they're like, he was making films up until like the mid two thousands, but these were kind of like his last two, like big, uh, you know, in terms of like money makers, I would say, I mean, closer did pretty well with the critics that was from 2004 the film with Julia Roberts and uh, Clive Owen and, and Natalie Portman, that was also Mike Nichols. That oh. film did pretty well with critics too. Oh, yeah. And then uh, maybe, you know, maybe one of the best things he ever made for sure is uh, Angels in America that he directed for HBO in 2003 mm -hmm. with Meryl Streep and Al Pacino. Yeah. So, uh, so he, he was one of those directors. He would have a hit and then not a hit. He directed in 2000, uh, this movie with uh, Gary Shandling, like a science fiction comedy. I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but it's, it, it was really bad. And it like, it was such a, it was such a disaster that I think after that, that's when he went to HBO and he did a movie called Wit with, uh, oh, it was called What Planet Are You From? <laughs> did you see that? Nope. <laughs> Gary Shandling and Annette Benning from 2000. And that was yeah. such a disaster. I think he went to HBO for a while. He did Wit with Emma Thompson and Angels in America. Thankfully, you would have at least one more great theatrical film in Closer in 2004. Uh, but the birdcage, I think, represents one of the best ensemble casts of any movie in the 90s. <laughs> what do you, <laughs> yep. you have Rob Williams, Nathan Lane in kind of his breakthrough movie role. Like he had been in Lion King as a voice. He was really known as a stage actor yes. before the birdcage. Yes. In my research, I read that initially Steve Martin was going to play the Robin Williams role of Armand. And Robin Williams was going to play the Nathan Lane role. Steve <laughs> Martin can... dropped out and Williams decided, I'd actually, I'd like to play the, the, the more quote unquote straight, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, the more serious of the two. And yeah. then that's when they brought on Nathan Lane. Steve Martin is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I cannot see that version of the movie. <laughs> no. But, Robin Williams, that would have been problematic, Mark. If Robin Williams had played the flashy, like gay uh, Nathan, I don't think that would have worked as well. I, don't, I, I could see. I mean, he, you know, he, he had <laughs> that, that that sense of you know cartoonish yeah. care. You know, yeah, I mean, it's I, it's not outside the realm of possibility. I can yeah. see it. I just don't think the movie would have worked as well. I'm, I'm glad that it, <laughs> but, but I, I could have seen him do that, but I'm glad that it, yeah. it went the way that it did. Because Nathan Lane is a treasure in this. I think of all the actors, the one who deserved an Oscar nomination was Nathan sure. Lane. Absolutely. I'm kind of surprised in a year of like Cuba Gooding Jr. won Best Supporting Actor for Jerry Maguire, yeah. a comedic performance that Nathan Lane was not nominated at the Oscars. He got a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor in a Comedy. Maybe yeah. it's a case of like, he's kind of in the middle. He's not quite supporting. He's not quite lead. That might've played a role. I don't yeah. know. But it's also hard for comedies. I mean, you get the occasional, uh, you know, Bridesmaids <laughs> nomination for well, Melissa McCarthy. And at the same time, again, it, like it's, it was a time when if there was going to be a movie about gay characters, you know, you wanted, I mean, you could, 
I mean, obviously, you know, Tom Hanks in Philadelphia, but that was, you know, a dramatic and tragic role. Whereas mm -hmm. with, I, I think if you wanted to, you know, get, make it Oscar contending, then it needed to kind of fit that mold that it had to yeah. be more serious, more dramatic. But I it's think. just like watching this again last night, I just wrote like, gosh, what a cast. So you have Robin Williams, Nathan Lane, Hank Azaria, who's very funny. So <laughs> what, what, what is the Agador Spartacus? <laughs> like they call him on the on the night of the dinner you have gene hackman one of my faves i miss him he retired in 04 he's still with us in 2021 but he retired from acting yeah uh, he is just great he's so funny in this diane weist is one of my favorite character actresses ever if she's yeah. in a project i'll watch it i love her and this is one of like her most maybe charming performances in a movie i just find her so warm yeah. and wonderful in this you have Dan Futterman, who would, uh, I think he's acted here and there, The Sun. Uh, mm -hmm. He got an Oscar nomination for his screenplay of Capote from 2005. He's also a screenwriter, so he's okay. an Oscar nominee. And then you have a very, very young Callista Flockhart, <laughs> who would go on to be out in Allie McBeal and do a whole bunch of stuff in her career. This was kind of her, the first thing I think most people had seen her in. Because she, she looks so young. Allie McBeal was 97. So that premiered. This. Yeah. And maybe this was the film that kind of helped. Them. I would assume this was such a huge hit. I'm assuming that her role in the birdcage helped get her to Allie McBeal. I don't know that for a fact, but I would assume that played a role. <laughs> you know? Now she's married to Harrison Ford. <laughs> now she's married to Harrison Ford. Yeah, which is crazy. Um, and then beyond them, you also have Christine Baranski, the great Christine Baranski, who I've really come to appreciate now after finally, after many, many years uh, off the air, I finally binged all seven seasons of The Good Wife uh, with uh, Juliana Margulies and Christine Baranski. Such an amazing show, Mark, if you haven't seen it. Like I really now, when it comes to television, I almost exclusively watch like streamer streaming shows, HBO, Showtime. I really don't watch NBC, CBS, ABC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just I like to be able to watch a show where they can kind of do anything where they're not like subject to <laughs> be, being censored. Yeah. The Good Wife is an exception. Such an astonishing show. And Christine Baranski is so great in that. And I've, I've moved on to her spinoff show, which is on CBS All Access, which is called The Good Fight, where she yeah. plays the same role. Uh, so great. And so this probably would have been the first thing I saw her. And I think around 96 she was doing a show. Was it Sybil? I think it was Sybil. Like in the mid '90s, she was on a sitcom. I want to say it was that one with Sybil Shepherd. She was a. Uh, she would have been like. A, she would have been like a supporting role on Sybil's show. Yeah, I think yeah. she won like an Emmy for it or something. I think that was kind of like what she was up to at this time. That's what people knew her from. Uh, then, but she's only in, she's only in the movie briefly, but she's a warm presence. I, you know, if any sequence in the movie that you could maybe consider a lull, it'd be. Her, her scenes with Robin Williams when he goes to ask her to, hey, can you be our son's mother uh, at the dinner tonight with the conservative parents? And they like dance in her office. And yeah. that would be the one sequence, I guess, I like if there was like a part of the movie that's a little bit of a lull, you could call it that one. But yeah. she is so charismatic and they have like this kind of unique chemistry in that sequence that yes. I, I, I love that that sequence is there. I, li I like that that's not just passed over. I, I like that we have that. So yeah, I mean, the, the cast in this movie is so great. And they just all work together really well. This is a case of a comedy where every actor was perfectly, you know, every every character, like the perfect person at the time. <laughs> I think if this movie had been made in 91 or 2001, I think it was made at the perfect time with just the right people. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Uh, I, I haven't mentioned yet it was based on a, a French film from 1978 called Le Cas Jaffol. I don't yeah. know how to say that, but uh, that was a big money maker in 78 in France, and there were two sequels. And uh, I remember at the time, uh, Roger, Ebr Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel were kind of so so on the birdcage because they said, well, if you've seen the French film, it's like a virtual remake. So there are no surprises. I right. still, to this, still to this day have never seen the French version, so I don't know. I guess if you had seen that first, then yeah, maybe the birdcage wouldn't be as good, but I've yeah. only seen the, the, the American version. Same. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's kind of just go through the movie. Any scenes that we like in like the first third? So uh, I should mention, this, was, this blew my mind last night. Do you know who was the cinematographer of the birdcage? <laughs> I do not. Emmanuel Lubie uh, uh, how do you say it? Uh, Lubieski. 
they, uh, he's called Chivo on the set. So the guy who would go on to win three Academy Awards for cinematography three years in a row for Gravity, for Birdman, and for The Revenant. He oh. works with uh, Ina Ritu and Quaran, and uh, he's done some amazing work for Terrence Malick. Okay. He shot the birdcage. And that's why the opening shot of is so great of the camera going across the ocean all the way up to the birdcage doors. The camera goes inside. It sweeps around the whole place all the way up to the stage in one shot before he <laughs> before that opening 13-minute shot of gravity. Yeah. <laughs> what, cl close to 20 years later, he was already showing what he could do in the birdcage uh, yeah. it actually i guess is three shots molded into one uh, mm -hmm. but the opening is so great the opening music uh the introduction to nathan lane is classic right him not wanting to go on stage he's having a diva moment yeah <laughs> when he's yeah. he's like i'm short and fat and you did this to me and robin williams says i made you fat <laughs> or no robin williams says i made you short and then he goes, ah, and he like jumps around and, and, and flops down on his chair. And uh, It's a great introduction to Nathan Lane's character, I think, at the beginning of this movie. We don't have quite the same introduction to Robin Williams. He just kind of shows up. He's just kind of running the show. Yeah. Uh, really, the flashy opening moment in this is uh, Nathan Lane. It's Nathan Lane. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then it moves into, so basically, so the setup is, well, we're introduced to the sun, and the way that they introduce the sun, it's sort of, it's a little, uh, it's a little. There, there, there's a suggestion that like Robin Williams, uh, Armand is like dating a younger man or something. That's what, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what Nathan yeah. Lane says. He sort of slips into the house and then, you know, goes over and then gives him a hug. But then you find out, oh, well, that's his son. So then, yeah, telling <laughs> yeah. him that he's met this girl, that they're getting married, and that he wants to introduce the parents to him. But the parents, as we find out of his new fiance, Callista Flockhart, uh, the father is a, is he a senator? Or a, I can't remember. Or he's, a, he's a senator. He's running for re-election. Running for re-election. So this is an important time in his political yeah. career. Conservative senator. So again, this is yeah. the night. Not just like, extremely conservative but he's on like this uh committee of like moral order <laughs> yes yes exactly. you know? <laughs> so kind of like they're like the, the their version of the moral majority and yeah so and then we come to find out that because then it switches over to the to the house of the the senator and his wife and they're uh there's a scandal that has broken out. And so he's trying yeah. to, I love that scene where they're up in the bedroom and they're you know, <laughs> scrambling, you know, watching on TV, the people talking about this scandal. And then he's trying to, they, they, there are reporters gathered outside the front of the house. And so then uh, Gene Hackman tries to climb out of the window down a ladder and, he, <laughs> yeah. and then there are, you know, he met with- They're the, already, uh, they already got the cameras right behind them. Already got him there. So they've got to find a way to get out to get away from the heat of this scandal. So then they decide to go down to Florida where their daughter's- Yeah, so I, so what, I think what works so well about this movie, so there is like a plot to get behind that adds tension and suspense all the way into the final kind of memorable sequence. Uh, but just like the setup, it could have been simpler. It could have just been like, oh, he's conservative. And that's like, that's makes him the antagonist or something. But it's like, no, he's like, he's running for reelection. He's the vice president of this committee. The president yeah. of the committee was found like dead in the bed of some like, <laughs> what does he call it? Like a prostitute or something like yeah, really yeah. not looking good. Right. And so he really needs, and, and it's Diane Weiss, character of Louise, who says to him, to Kevin, played by Hackman, uh, you know, I think a, a really big white wedding for our daughter would be exactly what you need right now to ensure reelection. I think it'll show your values to the country. And so that just creates just higher stakes. Like they really need the parents of the boy to be these, you know, these two from Greece or cultural attaches or what do they call it? Like, yeah. So there's like high stakes for everybody in this movie. And that's what makes it like so funny. And so you're just like on the edge of your seat the whole movie. The son's trying to, you know, the son wants to make a good impression with his, with his fiance's conservative politician parents and yeah. then politician conservative parents 
are trying to paper over this scandal and then only to yeah so here he is the mm -hmm. you know trying to you know representing the the moral values of conservative mm -hmm. america and, and then the last thing that he needs to find out is that the the man that his daughter is going to marry is the son <laughs> of and <laughs> is the son of a gay nightclub owner in miami yeah. who is living with another man mm -hmm. That's yeah the last thing that they need to happen and what Another thing I love about this movie is towards the beginning, you know, the son comes to Armand, his father, with this idea of like, okay, her conservative parents are coming. We got, we got to get rid of stuff, some stuff, some tough <laughs> dad. We, we can't have you acting and looking this way for the parents. And I love that. I, I feel like it could have been like, oh, well, you know what? You're my son. Okay, I'll do this for you. But before he comes to that decision, he really is like, I'm not going to be someone else. It's okay, powerful. it took me 20 years to get to this point, to finally yeah. feel like myself in this body, okay? So screw that guy. I'm not doing it, and, and walks out in a huff. I really like how that scene ends with not to say, okay, son, I'll do that for you. Like, and no, he's not going to do that right away. And it's if, not until he realizes his love for his son that he's like, okay, right. I'll do it but for if, you for if, one night. <laughs> it fits into what we said earlier, that it, it treats the these people with care, and it treats them like humans. And mm -hmm. that, I, I find that to be a really powerful moment, that he... That Robin Williams says, mm. "I'm not going to change who I am." Yeah, not, you know, and it, it's such a and just it, how 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 proud Robin Williams is yeah. in this role. He's not playing this like winking at the audience. Hey, look, I'm playing a gay guy. Like he is fully invested in this character, and he always 100 comes off as real. And he, he has feelings, and he and, and he's a he's a three dimensional person, and it comes and through really well. And I think it's important to point out that I feel like in 2021, we, we, we kind of, I think we might take that for granted because yeah. then a much greater conversation and a much greater acceptance and inclusion of queer characters in media. Mm -hmm. But for, for that to be happening from in 96, in 96 yeah. I, I think that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. I mean, really in 96 around that time, really the only great examples of, gay characters in films that were that were you know through the director through the screenwriter were treated as three-dimensional human beings you'd find that more in independent films like smaller yeah. movies in big studio comedies if you had a gay character it'd be a comic relief it'd be a side character hey. uh, you know i i don't want to say this was the first movie to do it but i feel like it's one of the first studio comedies to really you know yeah. handle the gay characters with care and affection and that not have them just be comic relief yeah, and that were commercially successful. Mm -hmm. That were not just you know. Yeah, and be a huge money maker. A hundred million dollars. That yeah. that that made a huge difference. You know, right. the next year we would get uh, In and Out with Kevin Klein, which was the first studio comedy rated PG thirteen about a gay protagonist. Right. Uh, and that movie's a little bit goofier, <laughs> I think, than yeah. overall than The Birdcage. I like I like that one too. I don't think it's as good as The Birdcage, but uh, yeah. but I feel like this movie it was, was an important film at the time. And uh, I might have been two or three years too young for it, but I certainly enjoyed myself. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then, so I forgot, there's a big chunk of the movie where basically they're just Gene Hackman and, and Diane Weiss, and they're just like driving to the house. Like they're, they don't have a whole lot to do in like the middle chunk of the movie. They're just like driving. No. <laughs> it was the, the, the main, the big part of the, you know, kind of the, I don't know if it's the climax necessarily, but you know the 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 bit the buildup is to their actual meeting with. So yeah, so so it makes sense. We're focusing on Armand and um, Albert. They, yeah, Albert trying to adapt and you know scrambling to make yeah. this whole thing work. You know, sort of like yeah, and then which but, which leads to some crowd pleasing moments, right? So obviously, one of the most memorable scenes is at the lunch table of Armand right. trying to teach. Albert, how to eat like a man, walk like a man, walk like Jane, John Wayne. And Mike Nichols, I don't know if this was in the script or not, but him putting just that one other patron like nearby that like middle-aged woman, like eating her lunch and reading the paper while like Nathan Lane saunters into the frame, like as John, like, like that little touch of having that extra. <laughs> Makes the scene twice as funny. I love when he walks by her and then she's just like, "Yeah, she doesn't react big. Yeah. She just kind of like goes." <laughs> what are you doing? That part that, that that's one of my favorite scenes. I was also going to mention when the son 
is talking to our mind and saying, and, you know, because I mean, the, out of the two, our mind, it would be the more, uh, the more masculine, quote unquote, of the yeah, two. Yeah. But the son even points out, like, you know, dad, you've got to tone it down too. And like, and that, mm-hmm. that whole, and then especially when he's going around and pointing out the different things in the house that need to go, like the, the, the phallic looking art objects, like that. <laughs> oh, it's kind of funny. <laughs> He's like, that's art. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'll turn it around. Now you just see the buttocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, dad, it's, it's, it's all got to go. <laughs> it's all got to go. Can you imagine like all of that artwork, all of that stuff, and it has to be hauled out in like a day? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a substantial. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, you would need a lot of help. I, thankfully, he owns this club, right, where he has all these guys who can come up and help him. <laughs> And then we have the the Hank Azaria character who yes so I mean would you say his character is maybe that the most problematic of the movie because he's a straight actor right he was married to Helen Hunt he's a straight actor yeah playing this very like over the top character (laughs) he's definitely the most cartoonish character and he's definitely you know out of if you were out of what we talked about the different examples of gay characters you know if you're trying to fit them into well they can be comic relief i mean i think he would he's the comic even, relief <laughs> even though nathan lane is excuse me you know definitely a good source of that comic relief there are dimensions to him and he is you know he he is yeah. the 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 spouse the partner yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good point whereas but even i don't know i i find i still find Hank Azaria, I can't remember his name off the top of my head in the movie. Uh, but I, I, I find his character to still be redeeming, e- even in some aspect. But that does bring up, yeah, as you said, Agador. Quite, <laughs> Agador. But That's it does what he's credited him. about the gay, you know, straight actors play. I mean, you know, you have Robin Williams was a straight actor playing mm-hmm. gay character. You had Hank Azaria. Nathan Lane is. He was not out at the time, but he would come out later. Yeah. He will come out later. But so yeah, I mean, there, there, and that's a conversation that has definitely gotten more heated over the years mm-hmm. with any kind of queer character, with um, whether it's you know gay, lesbian, trans, you know, th- there's been a much wider conversation. Yeah, it's a people. tough deal, right? It's kind of hard. I kind of look at it as more of a case by case basis, and a little. I mean, it's like it's hard to just blanketly say no straight actors can play gay in a movie, and no gay actors can play straight in a movie. I, I don't know. It's 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 a, it's a little it's a it's it. You, I mean, some of my favorite films. I mean, like Brokeback Mountain is a great example, a movie that I adore that I just think is such an important groundbreaking film. And you know, call those, me by your name, both of call those me by your name. Both of those back to the yeah, exactly. So it's you know it's it's a conversation that's going to continue. But you know, I just watched uh, season three of The Sinner on Netflix, and Matt Bomer is playing a straight. Uh, person in in that show and he's a gay actor so neil patrick harris and gone girl right so you know met your mother (laughs) yeah so yeah it's it's tricky right uh i mean i think at least in the case of the birdcage even the flamboyant hank azari character i think they're 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 playing the roles that to the best of their ability and i think as i said before especially robin williams really treats that character with a lot of humanity does not play it in a way that's like trying to be goofy. I mean, he really plays it pretty dramatic. I mean, the only moment where he gets really silly is when he's up on that stage, like trying to, the, the they're like doing a rehearsal of something to come. And he's like doing, doing Madonna, Madonna. And he does that like big dance. That's like the only part in the movie where he's really going like Robin Williams-y. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, you know, it's mo- he's mostly playing it serious. Compared to his more compared to many of his other famous it's a very restrained robin williams which i usually i mean my favorites of his you know he's usually a bit more animated but he's such he was such a great dramatic actor too and people forget that sometimes well he won an oscar for goodwill hunting so Mm -hmm. yeah recognition of his range there (laughs) yeah absolutely so so yeah let anything else before before the couple, before the parents arrive at the house, any other scenes worth mentioning? Um, let's see. Oh, so I did question, uh, I, I mean, it, I forgot, the movie goes into it a little bit, but I found it interesting that we have a movie here where we have the son. So Armand slept with a woman played by Baranski when they yep. were like in their 20s. 
for one night and that produced a child and she gave the child up to be with him yes. right where most stories most films it would be the the opposite right the the right. mother would have kept the child especially you know i mean maybe in so this was made 96 so in the mid 70s you'd think it would have made sense that like the mother would have kept the child and the gay man who <laughs> had sex with me the one time would go off to be with his you know his gay you know companion and right. maybe, maybe if they go their separate ways uh she says in the movie like i just I, i've never been maternal like she just she was not a mother so but what yeah. struck me as odd i'd never thought of this before is that okay so she, so he has never met her he is 20 years old he's never met his mother but mm -hmm. she lives 30 minutes away <laughs> she I mean, drives 30 minutes to like to go to be there for that the dinner so it's not like she's across the country. <laughs> yeah. well, I guess it could happen. It could happen. Okay. That was, that was, I was like, that's kind of interesting. So, I mean, I, I mean, he's not living there, right? He's having his own life elsewhere. He, like he's in college, right? So college. he's just at home visiting. Um, but yeah, that was kind of intriguing. And it's also really just comforting and kind of warm that she's like, yes, I will do that for my son. Yeah. In 20 years, I've never been there for him. I can do this for him. Um, which makes it so sad that she she actually does show up and she's there for him, but she's too late. <laughs> you know, right. Albert has come to play. Um, yeah, so yeah. let's talk about that final sequence, which Mark is just that twenty minutes <laughs> of the dinner is just classic. I mean, everything lands, everything is just pitch perfect in that sequence. I don't know yeah. how much of that is Elaine May in the screenplay, Mike Nichols. Who Mike Nichols, you know, he's done some funny films. I mean, this is really his only example of like pure, like screwball comedy for 20 plus yeah. minutes in a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, most of his films are more dramatic. So this is kind of that one example of that. But I feel like as a director of that sequence, that would be tough. You've got all these actors, you have to get the the framing and the and the you know positioning of where everyone's sitting, and then they're standing and then they're dancing, and then they're over here. And then like that would be you have like what six seven actors in the space that would be tricky but he he pulls it off man i mean th that that sequence just works beautifully <laughs> and everyone in the scene is is just firing on on all cylinders i mean everything yeah. just works. it's exactly as uncomfortable and <laughs> hilarious as you want it to be and mm -hmm. It's just, and like, you know, like it's, it's the meshing of all of these agendas and worries that each of these different parties are having. Yeah. Just colliding together. And it's, it, it's, it's fantastic. Like Kevin and Louise are like, oh, is the, is the mother not here yet? Cause she heard the scandal story and, you know, oh, this yeah. makes us feel bad. Like, oh, she doesn't want to be here because of the scandal and just the mixed communication. Nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> it just works so well and you just got these great actors just feeding off each other i wrote down i i love hackman and weiss as a couple like i don't think they ever appeared in another film together like i would love to have seen a movie just like about them in a film like i just think they're, they're great together good chemistry um, there. good now, chemistry there you're gonna have to remind like i said it's been a while since i've seen it does when albert decides that he's going to impersonate the wife and yeah. Is the son is the son not aware of this? So yeah, I actually I actually made that note last night. So we don't get, you know, we don't get a moment of like Albert sitting there thinking like, hmm, like there's there's really no and there's no anticipation that that's gonna happen. Nobody knows it's coming, right? Okay. When he when Albert in drag pretending to be the mom walks in. Mike Nichols pushes the camera up to Armand and the son and their <laughs> eyes are doing this. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't remember if the, he had just sprung it, if he had just showed up in no, the room. It's a big surprise. There's like, there's like dialogue happening. The scene's already in motion. And then you just hear, Oh, <laughs> she comes, so sorry. I'm late. And, 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 and the push in on Robin Williams eyes, just doing this like is so hilarious. And Gene Hackman's like, oh, hi. And, and another kind of unique little tidbit of, like is that Gene Hackman's character of Kevin is like kind of smitten with Nathan Lane <laughs> as <Yeah>. the mom. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, I just love her. Oh, she's yeah. so intelligent. Do not patronize your mother. She's an incredibly intelligent woman. And he's smiling and he's, and then they're dancing. And then, 
It's so good. Now, I, it's a little, like, you can tell that's a man to some extent. You have to, if there's one thing in this movie, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit at that. Like, you, you can tell. You can tell, I mean, but it's a conservative. I mean, they they are not seeing drag queens every day. So I was gonna say you have to assume that he is so insulated in his, you know, uh, wasp <laughs> yeah. bubble that he wouldn't be able to tell. He wouldn't uh, be able to tell, and it wouldn't even be at the like it wouldn't even click, like right. unless it was really, really obvious, right? Exactly. So she gets it like Nathan Lane gets away with it just enough. Yeah, but he's not, I mean, like. Dustin Hoffman in Tootsie looks like a woman, like when he's yeah. a woman in that, yeah. more so I think than like Nathan Lane in the Birdcage. Like you can you can kind of see, but also we've spent you know what an hour plus with him not in drag, so there's yeah. that too. I don't know, uh, but what what makes it so great is just how the affection from from Kevin, the conservative, who you know a character as I said could have been kind of the villain, could have been really awful. You know, a yeah. different actor might have made that character not very charismatic, but Gene Hackman is just so likable that we go with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's that early scene of them watching like him on CNN, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, some things haven't changed. Except back in 96, Mark, political political scandal was about sex. <laughs> yeah. All we are. I, I oh, the 90s. A year after this, the Monica Lewinsky yeah. scandal. That's again. after this, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> but it, it also fits with the time because you know this was uh, you know, Clinton had just won re-election, but at the you know didn't quite. It wasn't a grand sweeping of you know him. Re, I mean, he he kind of just barely swept into winning re-election because and there was mm. you know we have Newt Gingrich has come onto the scene, and so yep. there's. A, the mid nineties was a really interesting time for this kind of, you know, rise of ultra, you know, Fox news concern. I mean, Fox news wasn't really what it was. So if it was even on the air at that point, it wasn't what it was yeah. you know, become now, but, but this was sort of, I, I, it's interesting to w look at this from the, the lens of how, how we perceive politics and conservatism and liberalism now. And you sort of go, well, if you think about the wider context of it back in the mid nineties, it was, you know, these were the things that were popping up, you know, political scandals based around, you know, impropriety and people, you know, having affairs and doing things they shouldn't be doing while outwardly, you know, projecting, you know, these, you know, highly moralistic mm -hmm. values. And so that it's, it's an interesting comment, whether that was intentional, it's a very interesting commentary on a lot of things that were happening at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And and as I say, like the political nature of this movie, it's very appropriate of 96. I think if you were to make The Birdcage now, a lot I don't even know if you could make this movie now, honestly. Like if this movie came out today, I don't think it would work. <laughs> you know, well, like, and also it's very much of its time. It it kind of is. And also because of how much how much the conversation has increased about yeah about different types of families and different types of, of relationships. Mm. And so you would, I don't know. I, I, I don't, don't think know. it'd be, I almost think if they were to make it now, it wouldn't be very funny. Cause I just feel like we, we, we've gone beyond this. Oh, conservative parents can't handle a, you know, their, their, their daughter's marrying a boy who's got gay parents. Oh my gosh, the hilarity. I, I just don't think that premise works now. I just think that would be yeah. very uh, old fashioned. <laughs> I don't know what you could do with it to to put a spin on it or put a twist on it that would make it work nowadays. Yeah, but I but think. at the same time, you're able to watch this 25 year old movie and still love it. Like even though like some of the themes and ideas don't necessarily work in 2021, if the story were modernized, like looking at it through a lens of like, okay, this came out in '96, like you can really appreciate it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so the ending's great. I mean, Christine Baranski showing up and that whole confusion. And, you know, that's another case where Gene Hackman and Diane Weiss could have stormed out of there. I like, I, I, I still love to this day, I love her, uh, <laughs> when she goes over to Nathan Lane and puts her hand on his and she looks at Gene Hackman. This is a man. <laughs> and he goes, what? <laughs> he doesn't get it. Yeah. Oh, and I should have mentioned also the scene where they're, uh, they're about to have soup, right? And there's a, 
boys leapfrog, leapfrogging, yeah. uh, according to Gene Hackman. Uh, <laughs> that, from my, I still have vague memory of seeing this movie in a theater for the first time. And my vague memory is that that was the scene that got the biggest laughs, was them like trying to retrieve the glasses to see what's on the bottom of the bowl. Yeah. And Robin Williams is in the kitchen, like, get, get the soup, get the soup. <laughs> and then I, fr I, I freeze the frame this time and it, you know, no, <laughs> it's not boys leapfrogging. <laughs> and then, and then Diane Weiss not only gets the soup right away before she can see, but then there's a giant egg in the <laughs> Yeah. she says i have an egg in my soup and then robin williams like oh yeah that's a that's a that's a grease uh <laughs> that's something they do in grease <laughs> <laughs> but yeah just the rhythms of that sequence so funny and then we get to the end where we get really the like the one scene of the movie that's just they're all there in the space and mm -hmm. that's where you know they're trying to leave and they can't because of the news reporters yeah and so they're all just kind of hanging out in one of the bigger rooms of the space and they're trying to figure out what to do. And yeah. he's not, Gene Hackman's not hating on them in the scene. He's just kind of like, oh, this, this is not, this is unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, that takes us to the final big scene, which is, the, you know, one of the great visual gags of the movie. Yes. And that is Gene Hackman in drag. <laughs> yeah. Classic. So great. Like, I would love to be a fly on the wall for that day of production. Oh, and yeah. just follow Gene Hackman around that day. What was he thinking? What was he, what was he going? What was he up to that day? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you awesome. know. And then the the great final joke before the end credits of uh, him telling that guy, "Meet me at so and meet me at this this corner and this corner." And the guy says, "Lady, not for a million dollars." Just really, really funny, consistently funny all the way through from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. So many comedies I see now will be really funny for an hour. And then I just stop laughing and they just kind of lose steam. Yeah. This is the case of a comedy. It's two hours. This is a long comedy, two hours that I really wouldn't remove anything from it. And I think it's consistently funny all the way through. Right. Yep. So the bird cage uh, turning 25 on March 8th. I can't believe it's been 25 years since this movie came out, but that's the case of 2021. We've got some 25th anniversaries uh you know from 1996 which is i don't know about you that was a really important move uh, year for movies for me just 96 that was probably the first full year i was going all the time and really paying attention to cinema yeah, it was 96 a, i can think of a handful of movies that i know were central to my existence at that <laughs> <laughs> so i i'm not going to do bonus episodes on all of them but there will be some later this year particularly yeah. scream one of my favorites came out yes. in December of 96. We'll definitely get to that one. Uh, but to wrap up here, Mark, I just wanted to, you know, just take a few minutes and talk about Robin Williams, who we yes. lost in 2014, probably of the last 10 years, like probably the celebrity death that hit me the hardest of the last mm -hmm. 10 years was Robin Williams. So yeah. unexpectedly, so tragically uh, left us, you know, such a great, such an amazing legacy of so many films, decades of great films. What are yeah. like two or your three favorite Robin Williams films? Well, I mean, there, he was such a, if you were our age, if you were a kid of the, the late, well, I guess, I mean, I was only four in the late, but if you were a kid of the early to mid nineties, yeah. Robin Williams was probably the biggest star in the world. And mm -hmm. so for me, it would have, the, the two movies that I, I mean, obviously there are so many, it's hard to pick from, but the ones that I, when I think of Robin Williams, I think of these movies, it's Mrs. Doubtfire, of course. I mean, that was such a, it, it, it was one of those movies, adults would love it, kids loved it. I mean, there classic. was classic. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> classic. And it, it's so, I mean, I remember being, you know, seven or eight years old and just if, if the movie was on TV or if, you know, you, you saw it in the video store, you would, you would have to watch it. I mean, there was no getting around it. So Mrs. Doubtfire. And then the other one would probably, it would have to be Aladdin. Yep. Honestly. Yeah. That's <laughs> one of my favorite. Well, movies. yeah. <laughs> my top three would be Aladdin, the birdcage and Mrs. Doubtfire too. <laughs> if I had to pick three now, I love him as a dramatic actor. So many yeah. great dramatic performances. I love Good Morning Vietnam, Dead Poets Society, Goodwill Hunting, which he won his Oscar for. Uh, one Hour Photo. 
I was just going to say, I never saw a one hour photo. And I was always intrigued. I want, I, oh. I'm curious to see what he's like in that because he's, he's, a, he's not, it's not a dramatic, he's a villain. He's, it's, movie. well, I wouldn't go as far to say villain, but yeah, he's like the darker kind of more yeah. antagonistic character in the movie. Basically it's about, he, he, he's got a, he's got no life. He has no friends, no family. He lives in this dumpy one bedroom and his basically his career is his whole life. He just works as like a photo developer, like a one hour photo place in the grocery store. Uh, and he becomes obsessed with this family. This woman keeps bringing in pictures for him to develop of her perfect family. And yeah. he, over the course of many weeks and months, he becomes obsessed with them and starts like stalking them. It's uh, director Mark R Romanek, who made a lot of uh, music videos. He also directed a great film called Never, Never Let Me Go, I think it's called, with Carrie yeah. Mulligan and Andrew Garfield. And it's so dark and disturbing. And, and it's like at the heart of it is Robin Williams, who is just terrifying in this movie, yeah. but not in a way that's like a villain, like a Friday the 13th or something. He's not like, you're not like, oh my God. It's just, he's just, he's so sad. And so yeah. like, it's such a, an amazing performance. I still can't believe he didn't get an Oscar nomination for it. He was so good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're a Robin Williams fan, if you, if you have not seen One Hour Photo, like if you haven't seen uh, some of his dramatic works, definitely check that one out. I also like World's Greatest Dad from 2010. That was probably the last great film I saw him in. Mm -hmm. uh, also a darker story about suicide. And he's also a teacher and a writer and really interesting film. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's hard. It's like, I kind of would have to separate like three comedy favorites, three drama favorites. <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah. like what I put one hour photo over like Aladdin and Mrs. Doubtfire, no, but it's, no. but it's like the side thing. It's like, okay, if you're interested in him as a performer, definitely check out his dramatic work. Yeah. And Aladdin's tricky, right? I, I, Aladdin is tied with uh, Jurassic Park. Those are the two films I saw in a theater five times. Okay. <laughs> That's the, the, the record is those two movies at five. Nice. Uh, Aladdin is just so great. It's one of my top three or four favorite Disney animated films of all time. Uh, I mean, I think there's some more problematic elements of that movie today than, say, A Little Mermaid or Beauty and the Beast. Like, if you turn on Disney+, Plus, it's like, there are outdated cultural references, be it by what it says. Yeah, or, true. <laughs> you yeah. know, so there's some of that, but still so good. It's such, it's like, I, that's a case where he recorded, obviously, his lines first mm -hmm. so that they could animate around him. <laughs> like, they, they yeah. had to capture that performance, but you know, you don't really think of a whole lot of animated performances as like just larger than life, so iconic. It's impossible to think of Aladdin and not think of Robin Williams. He just really made that movie special. And it um, was one of the first, because the earlier, you know, the earlier Disney films, I mean, they didn't really have star names. They no, just that's, people, yeah, that's, that's who, something who, new. People yeah. who were well-versed and experienced in voice acting, but the, the, the idea of getting a big box office name to voice an animated character, that was a, that was, I think Aladdin was really one of the first examples of that. And then, it, you know, I mean, nowadays, you know, you see it all the time, you know, you get, I mean, you've got Tim Allen and uh, Tom Hanks and Toy Story and things like that, but, but that really started because of Aladdin where you mm -hmm. would in. Yeah, you know, it's weird. If you look back at like Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, there's like, I mean, there's character actors. There's people I know of. There's Angela um, Lansbury. Angela Lansbury is like the biggest name of either of those movies. Uh, yeah, Robin Williams kind of kicks off this now thinking of, oh, let's get stars, right? And sometimes I kind of like, I think Williams was perfect for Aladdin, but I think some of these movies, it's actually distracting when every voice you hear is a star. It's like, no, it's, we don't need that. Yeah, you're like, oh, I know who it is. So it takes it away from, yeah. <laughs> from the movie. And yeah. so I would put that three. I'd put uh, the birdcage second. I would put the birdcage right behind. They're very close. I'd put it right behind Mrs. Doubtfire in this case, because really the birdcage is very much, I think of as an ensemble piece of great actors. Yeah. Whereas if I'm going to pick a favorite Robin Williams, I would go with Mrs. Doubtfire because that to me, showcased his comedic skills in a film like like no other <laughs> like that Isn't movie it? works because of him like that is it's it's such a great story it's so funny sally yeah. field's great in it pierce brosnan's really good in it but really that's his showcase more than anybody else and uh that was him at the the, the height of his career he was just off of three oscar nominations right off of aladdin it's the year after 93 mm -hmm. uh i believe it came out uh thanksgiving week of 93 
Uh, and it was just, I mean, it was, there was nothing like it. Nothing like, I remember seeing, I saw it with my grandfather, just the two of us. We yeah. went and saw Mrs. Outfire in a crowded theater. There is nothing like a crowded theater watching a great, hilarious comedy. And speaking of, you know, the birdcage has that great last sequence at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Doubtfire also has that great final sequence at dinner where yeah. he's like, he's got two things. He's got, he's got to be himself for, you know, the, you know, the, um, the actor, what he, what is he, he's auditioning. He's like, he's like trying to get a job on that series on that show about dinosaurs. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's like, what was that guy? He's like the executive or the producer yeah. or something. It's an interview. It's like a meeting to talk about this the meeting. Show. Yeah, and yeah. he shows up mistakenly in Mrs. Doubtfire's garb. And then he goes, <laughs> without realizing yeah. that he's wearing Mrs. Doubtfire. And then he goes, oh, this is the host of your new show. And yeah, <laughs> so yeah. then it becomes an audition. Yeah, he sits down, he's like, woof. And, the, and then the guy, uh, I think is, uh, the actor's name is Robert Prosky. And he says, can I help you, ma'am? <laughs> can I help you? <laughs> and he's like, uh, Daniel? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you dressed Why like in the world are you dressed like a woof? <laughs> and then they're right next to like just just a few feet away there's like the family there waiting for him like okay he's going again. uh i really love that sequence i love that movie it's definitely my favorite if i had to pick a favorite Ro robin williams vehicle it'd be mrs doubtfire but he had so many great films other great comedies we haven't even mentioned hook which was a bit important movie for me when i was a kid that was my first spielberg movie in a theater so not one of the best spielberg movies but holds a place in my heart for sure hook is great Oh, um, Jumanji, Jumanji really uh, fun. Like you know, that was that was a lot of fun too. One that I always loved, and I feel like kind of get gets forgotten is Jack. Jack, <laughs> which it's, yeah, I liked it at the time. It's not one I've really revisited much in the last no. twenty five years. That also came out in ninety six. Yeah, uh, you will not be seeing a bonus episode about Jack. <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah, kind of fun. Him playing a ten year old. But it was still like in that that time where it just, I mean, there were so many movies. Yeah, he would be in three to four movies a year for a while. That was crazy. Like 95, 96, 97. He's in like three, four movies every year. Yeah. <laughs> like 97, we get not very good comedies from him, like Father's Day and Flubber. But well, then Flubber. we get Good Will Hunting in December and he wins an Oscar. Yes. So he proves that you can have two major stinkers in a year and still win the oscar <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we miss him he passed away in 2014 yeah you know uh, at the end of his career uh i liked a film he did called boulevard that came out after his passing he plays a gay character actually it's a kind of worth worth a look uh, i believe it finally came out in 2015 i watched that on on demand i remember really liking that it's kind of a quiet character study Mm -hmm. um the night listener from 2006 and the final cut from 2004 two other dramas he did that were pretty good okay. so he had if you look i mean yeah he had some sinkers as every actor does but he actually had some interesting projects throughout his career he could have just done 30 years of comedies and he right. he did not he broke out of that and did a lot of interesting dramatic work too so we miss you robin and uh so happy that at least we have all all this great work you're immortalized on film forever you know including with the birdcage, which was a lot of fun to talk to you about, Mark. So thanks for being here today on Film with 50 for this exclusive episode, The Birdcage Turning 25. And thank you to all of you for listening. We will catch you next time on Film with 50.